All right, you guys, you know what it is. This episode 36 of War Stories. And without further ado, I'm going to get straight to it. So check it out, you guys. I'm going to take you guys back to 1994 to an incident that happened in the infamous Army Street Projects. For those of you that are from the city, that are familiar with some of the areas out there in Frisco, you already know Army Street was lit. It was off the hook. For those of you that aren't familiar with Frisco and some of the rough terrain out there, like the poverty stricken areas, like the Mission District, Army Street Projects, Sunnydale, Swampy D, Hunters Point, Fillmore. I'm going to take you a little bit through the history, what was happening in the 90s when I was running around out there, as well as where these places are at today. Now, as far as Army Street, I always considered Army Street to be part of the Mission District. It's literally two blocks away from my neighborhood within walking distance. I'm from 24th Mission. Army Street is on 25th and Cesar Chavez, Tree, Harrison, that area right there. So it's literally two blocks over. A lot of the times, you know, I'd walk over there from my neighborhood because I knew people over there. I cut dope over there if I needed a spot to you know, bag my shit up or something, I go to Army Street. I've been in a lot of different spots over there. Like I said, a lot of people that I knew lived in those projects. Now, the thing that made Army Street a little different from a lot of the other projects in Frisco is because Army Street projects were predominantly Africano. There were a lot of Africanos that lived out there, a lot of Africanos and Usos. However, because it was in the Mission District, you had some Rasa that lived in Army Street Projects as well. I'm not saying a lot, but more than the norm. And, you know, I used to fuck with, with some of the cats that lived over there. I had homies that lived in those projects. Army Street was ripe with history that was connected to the Mission District. Now, in the 90s, around 94, I left. Whether it was on a parole violation or a new commitment, I don't fucking know. I don't, I've been in and out so much that unless I really sit down and think about it, that's the only way I'm going to remember. But it doesn't fucking matter. At the end of the day, in this story, it doesn't matter. I was gone. I went, I went back in on, on a parole violation or a new commitment, and Army Street was still Army Street. When I came out, Army Street was gone. No mas, no more. Yastuvo, where the fuck did it go? It was completely gone. Like it never even been there. They tore Army Street down and completely reconstructed that whole area. I'm talking about they re they did such a good job at rebuilding that area that there was they didn't leave no trace of Army Street. It was like the projects never were even there. Now, San Francisco has these these Victorian style houses that the city is known for. You see these these big tall Victorian houses all over the city. You see them over there in the Sunset District. You see them over there by Dolores Park. They put those type of houses over there, and you know with those houses it changed the the schematics of the whole that whole neighborhood. The Africanos and the lower poverty. Those people, they all they were all gone. They all moved out, and you had a different class of people that moved in. I'm serious, man. They even built streets over there. They where, where the basketball court was, and where the it, it they completely just flipped that whole area. It was a trip driving through there, going out there and and seeing it how how much it changed. You guys should be seeing some of the pictures of what Army Street looked like when the projects were up and what it looked like afterwards, after they tore everything down and put these new homes up. You know, they, and San Francisco has a history of doing that. A lot of these areas, problem areas that they consider to be ghettos, you know, after a while, after so long, they'll end up tearing them down and they'll, they'll rebuild and they'll put in new homes. It's like they push all those people out, push them off to somewhere else, rebuild and bring in all these different people. That's what San Francisco is, is known for. It's been happening throughout the years. And I'm sure it's like that with other places. I'm sure it's like that everywhere in all the other big cities with you know some of the, the projects and the lower housing um, that's 
you know, in some of the other cities. You got, you know, so you got Army Street is just one of the projects out there. I mean, you got a, a, a shitload of projects. San Francisco is a big city. It's a big city. You guys know that there's a lot of diversity out there. There's a lot of different cultures, a lot of different ethnicities, a lot of different people out there. And with that, they had a lot of different projects, a lot of different places like the Army Street projects. You had so you can go all the way back to Yerba Buena, where it's that's what it was normally. That's the official name for it was Yerba Buena, but it was the the Pink Palace. The Pink Palace. The Pink Palace was fucking off the chains. This was a big ass, massive building. It was like a Brooklyn style type of of ghetto. You know, these big, huge buildings that uh, you see out there in like New York. Well, that's what the Pink Palace was like. There was probably like four or 500 apartments out there. Now, those of you from the Fillmore, you might be like, that, that Mexican don't know what the fuck you talking about. Maybe I don't. I don't remember exactly how many apartments were in the Pink Palace, but it was a, it was a huge building. And it was an inti- it had an intimidating presence about it. You could drive up to the Pink Palace and look at that motherfucker, and you knew bad shit was happening up there. It you, you it had a, a you know there was an air about it when you pulled up or when you went up in there. You just knew that this was a place that you shouldn't be fucking around in. You know, a lot of people got killed over there in the Pink Palace, and this was the Pink Palace was more. That was like the 70s generation. They tore that motherfucker down. I remember when it came out in the paper and they were like, you know what, Pink Palace, there's too much shit happening, too many people getting killed. So they they tore it down and put in a lot of other, you know, lower. At that time, they put in a lot of other lower income housing over there. They couldn't uh, do like they did over there in Army Street because you still had Fillmore over there. There was a lot of other projects that were around that area so you know i remember when the pink palace was up and then i remember when they tore it down so another another area out there that had a lot of history for a lot of bad shit happening was there was actually two towers that were called the geneva towers this was over there by the cow palace sunny sunnydale the the brick house is a place that they call the brick houses visitation valley the Geneva Towers, that was like my generation when I was a kid. When I was a kid and I was going to Visitation Valley, which was a pretty much was almost an all black school. I was one of the only Mexicans that went to that school. When I used to go to school at Viz, I would cut class and I had a bunch of little Afghano friends where we all used to cut class and we put our money together. And we go down to this liquor store and we have somebody spot for us, go in and buy us alcohol. And we get that alcohol and we go to the Geneva Towers and we go into the stairway and we sit there and we drink and smoke weed for hours. Now, let me tell you, let me tell you like this. The Geneva Tower, so like I said, it was two towers. These were pretty big buildings and they had a lot of history. I don't remember how many apartments there were in each one but they were pretty big and i would say there was probably like maybe 300 in each tower now there was like they were like 26 floors high i remember that the stairways in those towers there was a lot of shit a lot of bad shit used to happen in those stairwells the stairwells were if you went up in there they were dark you could barely see in there it was it was small you know, they were, uh, there was graffiti all over in there. There was always people sitting on the stairs, smoking crack, shooting dope, drinking. Like on every level, you, there was always something happening, different cats. And there were radios, drinking, doing their thing. If you didn't know somebody in the Geneva Towers, you didn't have no fucking business being over there. You would end up coming up, you could end up coming up short over there. That's what kind of place it was. You know, you had a lot of, a lot of cats over there that a lot of people getting jacked, a lot of people getting robbed, people getting beat up, people getting killed. A lot of people got thrown off the Geneva Towers. Dudes that I was in juvenile with, cats that I was in, you know, I used to go to school with that got thrown over the side of the Geneva Towers. They had like different floors and there was literally nothing to stop somebody from throwing you over. 
it was like a waist high fucking barricade and that was it but i knew a couple cats personally that died like that you know they got into some shit they got into a fight somebody tossed them over um that was another place where you knew that a lot of bad shit happened over there and eventually you know like with any of these other places they ended up tearing the geneva towers down now when they tore down the geneva towers it was a little different from like the pink palace the geneva towers were actually part of the san francisco landscape so when they tore these towers down it was a huge event they brought in this crew of imploders and they had people that came out there just to spectate and watch these massive towers implode. I remember I was locked up when it happened, but I remember getting the newspaper, the San Francisco Chronicle, and seeing some of the pictures. Then later on, I would see shit on YouTube where they, they imploded. And it was it was crazy they, the way that they came down, like any other building that implodes. The motherfucker came down. They, they dropped one, the first one. Then they dropped the second one, and they were nothing but huge clouds of dust. But it changed that whole area over there. You got an area right there called the Brick Houses. They're like, it's lower housing, lower income housing as well, but they're, they're actually a little bit nicer than kind of like regular projects. And there's, you know, a lot of Africanos that consider that to be part of the Sunnydale project lived in the Brick Houses. When I again, when I used to go to Visitation Valley, I had a lot of friends that lived in the brick houses. I had a lot of friends that lived in Sunny Sunnydale. So, you know, I used to run around over there at one time. These were my stomping grounds when I was a kid. But you know, after they tore down the Geneva Tower, you had other areas like Lakeview. Lakeview is another area that there's a lot of bad shit that goes on over there in Lakeview. You had uh, the Clementina Towers where that's down there by, I think, by Fort Mason. And, you know, it's it's considered low-income housing, but these, these two towers, they weren't like the Geneva Towers or the Pink Palace. Anything hardly happened over there. I mean, the bad shit happened like any other low-income housing, but you never really heard nothing about the Clementina Towers, man. It's just, they weren't out there like that. So you got Hayes Valley. You got... Um, uh, like I said, Sunnydale, Petrell Terrace, which is Petrell Hill. That's another uh, set of projects that have a lot of history in, in, in the city. You got um, Harbor Road, Hunters Point, West Point, Hunters Point, uh, Plaza East, Fillmore. You got um, Oakdale, North Beach, uh West Side Courts, Western Edition, Alamany Projects, Kirkwood, and then you got uh what are those houses over there? They're um the, the Robert Pitts apartments. I know I'm missing a lot of other projects that they have out there because these are different areas all throughout the city, but those are some of the main ones. Fillmore, HP, Sunnydale. Those are the main ones out there, you know, and for those of you that ever been to a 49er game back in the 80s when Candlestick was still up, when you had to drive out there to Candlestick through Bayshore, that was Hunter's Point. That was on one of the nicer areas of Hunter's Point. You didn't really see nothing getting off the freeway and, you know, driving to Candlestick and then you had that big ass parking lot right there. You didn't really see nothing over there. Now, if you went straight down Bayshore then you would see that that's an area that, you know, again, unless you knew somebody, you didn't want to be fucking around in that area. HP. HP has a lot of history. Anybody from the city, you guys already know. So anyway, back to Army Street. You know, Army Street, like I said, man, I have a lot of personal history over there. All the way back to when I was like 11 or 12, my stepfather used to drive me over there when I was a kid to get my weed. The Usos used to post up. So right there you had in Army Street, you had a basketball court. And then they had like a public swimming pool that was, you know, an indoor public swimming pool. But like outside, you know, the Usos used to post up right there and sell nickel and dime bags of weed. Buddha Thai, Skunk, Indo, Sesamia. 
That's what they used to sell back in those days. There's nothing like it is now. You didn't hear about all these cat piss, gorilla glue, cookies, and none of that shit. It was just Buddha Thai, chocolate Thai, Indo, some of that dirty Mexican weed, skunk, and um, that was pretty much it. That was pretty much it right there. But that's where I used to get my weed from the Usos. And I knew all the Usos over there. These guys all are from the Army Street Projects. Born and raised. You had like Paradise, Cedro, Hollywood, Eki, Ray Tavaki. I mean, it, you know, I can't remember them all, but those were some of the main ones that I remember. Now, at that time, 94, this was prior to me getting recruited um, as a C. At that time, I was running around with an individual that I'm not going to mention him by name because I still have a lot of respect for this individual and I'm still connected with him. And he's not the type of dude that wants to be mentioned on YouTube. So out of an abundance of respect for the homie, I'm not going to throw his name out there. We'll just call him the homie. So, you know, I, I, I ironically, I met him at the Army Street Projects, and he's from my neighborhood. We had never crossed paths before that, but this was somebody that, you know, he'd done a lot of time, and that's why we never met each other from the hood. He was locked up, I was out. I was out, he was locked up. So we always missed each other until one day I ran into him at the Army Street Projects, and, you know, game recognized game, man. We seen each other, we were both up to no good at that time, and we hooked up, and after that, we went on a little spree. You know, there was another individual that I got real tight with like that. Like, I referred to this dude as my brother. I referred to him as like like he was a biological brother. Matter of fact, we were telling everybody else from the hood that we were brothers. Now, he was a, a homie that met my mom, met my stepfather, you know, was embraced by my family. He, You know, he met my daughter, my kids. He was somebody that I really held you know, I held a lot of respect for him. I have a lot of respect for him still to this day. And like I told you guys before, man, there's certain individuals that you fuck with from the past. You've kicked it with these individuals. You've been in the trenches with them. And these types of bonds, relationships, they supersede anything and everything else, man. The, the fucking politics, the prison politics, the dumb shit, that shit's secondary when it comes to these types of relationships. You know, when you've been in the trenches with somebody and this is somebody that's had your back, you guys have been in some dicey situations and this is somebody that's always been there, that's never fucking let you down. You put your life in this individual's hands and vice versa. That's somebody that those types of relationships last forever. Now, I can name the individuals that I've had those types of relationships with on one hand. You know, there's only one other individual like that actually that I embraced like that and that was I'll throw him out there because I mentioned him in my book and he don't give a fuck he's doing life in prison so in my book I mentioned Sleepy John Romero from my neighborhood who I refer to as my criminal mentor the cat that basically laced me up and taught me everything I knew as a youngster he introduced me to a life of crime, taught me how to rob, taught me how to fucking uh, steal cars, how to, you know, do a uh, home invasions, everything. Everything that I learned early on came from him. The mentality, the, the mindset, it all came through Sleepy. And he was another individual that knew my mom, knew my stepfather. And, you know, we bonded. We bonded like that. We ran around and we were literally me and that cat were <laughs> engulfed in crime. And that's all we did. From morning to night, all we were doing was robbing, jacking, stealing. We did a lot of shit. Anyway, so this other individual that I'm telling you guys that I, that I was kicking him with at that time. So let me tell you guys a little bit about this dude. So I've talked about him in some of my other stories. Matter of fact, I told you guys about a robbery that I committed with him to where neither one of us knew what happened when we robbed this individual. We were drunk off of that fucking Cisco. I still think Cisco is fucking chemicals. It's got to be some kind of fucking chemicals. Some crazy shit. You know, I've drunk a lot of liquor before and nothing has ever faded me like that. 
Cisco knocked me the fuck out on my feet. Had me doing robberies that I don't remember. That's that's how that's how powerful that shit was, man. I I could drink gin, vodka straight, and it never fucked me up like Cisco. I don't know what's in Cisco, but shout out to Cisco, man. Anyway, so he's the individual that I told you guys about that when we we ended up robbing somebody, we didn't know the details of that robbery. If you guys remember. We were in the mission. We were drinking Cisco that night, obviously. And apparently we did what we did. All I remember is waking up in the substation in the mission district. And I was laying down in a, in a tank with the homie. And I remember just waking up. I was laying on the fucking bench on a roll of toilet paper. You guys already know what's up. You motherfuckers that been to these holding tanks. These uh um, what do they call them? Bullpens or uh um, uh, you know, in some of these little small holding tanks, like I'm talking about. You already know what's the pillow. It's a fucking roll of toilet paper. That's what you always do. You go grab the roll. That's your pillow, unless you got a jacket or extra shirt or something. That's your pillow. So anyway, I, I remember laying there. I was laying on the roll of toilet paper, and I, I I popped up, and I'm like, bro, what the fuck did we do? Why? We caught a case. What the fuck we get arrested for? I'm fucking drunk. Like I'm still leaning sideways off this shit. Anyway, at the time, the homie was arguing with some other, some cop out there about something. When I got up, I'm like, bro, fuck all that. What do we do, bro? So there was another officer that was cool. We asked him, hey, man, can you can you tell us what our charges are? And this guy went, got on the computer came back and said, you guys, they got you guys for a 211 strong arm robbery. What the fuck are you talking about? Anyway, we, uh, they end up booking us, taking us to 850 Bryant. They take us downtown to the county jail. And, you know, again, I'm still clueless as to what happened. They, they put me and the homie in the same tank. And I've told you guys before, Frisco is one of the most liberal counties in Northern California. Shout out to Kamala Harris and some of the other head district attorneys that were in Frisco during the 80s and 90s. Now, when you used to catch a case in San Francisco, so you they, they, they take you up to the sixth floor and every day, like the day after you got busted, what they would do was you knew that there was going to be a cop that was going to come by early in the morning. At six o'clock, everybody was waiting for that cop. He had two lists with him. Well, actually, he had three. Two of them were synonymous, meaning they were basically the same thing. It was called a D DA kickout list, a D a DA reject list, and a OR list on recognizance. So basically the DA reject or the DA kickout was like I said, it was the same thing. But what this was is it was basically the district attorney declining to pick up your case for whatever reason. Now, there's sometimes it's because of lack of evidence. Sometimes it's a weak case. Sometimes, you know, they just don't want to fuck with it or you don't you got somebody that's not wanting to press charges. But most of the time, like in my case, at least, is like if you were on parole, 90 percent of the time they would kick the case. Frisco would be like, this dude's on parole. Let's just dump the case. Let CDC deal with this dude. I'm not going to waste fucking money on this cat. That's what they would do. They have caught me dead hand, straight dead bang in the middle of robberies and kick the case every time and let me go and do my violation. And I was like, so that morning when we're there, they come through and they call both of us. They call homeboy first and then they go and they start calling some other names. I'm thinking, fuck, man, these motherfuckers better not. And then they finally called my name. So I'm like, cool, I'll take the violation. I ain't tripping. Even give me a year flat. It's good, man. Just as long as I ain't got no fucking new commitment. So anyway, I remember that incident right there. We ended up going to Quentin. And we actually did not find out the details of the robbery until we got a revocation uh, paperwork from parole. And that's when 
I when I got went to screening, they gave me a copy of the police reports and fucking typical dumb Mexicans, man. Straight up. We ended up jacking some fool on the street. We walked up to him and said, I punched him. I punched him. We got him down. We're fucking flipping his pockets inside out, taking all his money. We go through his pockets and then we walk off. Our dumb asses, dumber and dumber, man. Our dumb asses walk a block up to the first taqueria, two hungry motherfucking Mexicans. You know what I'm saying? And we stand in line like two dummies and we're looking up there like, mm, carne asada. Um, I'll take some guacamole on that with some queso, some arroz, y, uh, frijoles, and look over and be like, oh, no, you ain't. SFPD walked in. You guys know the drill. Put your hands behind your back. You're under arrest. So we get busted. Standing in line ordering some fucking burritos. Tell me that ain't some shit. Anyway, so that's the homie that was involved in this incident that I'm going to tell you about. That was the robbery I caught with him. So he was the type of cat. So Puerto Rican cat stood about 6'3", was about, eh, I want to say 240. Yeah, he was tipping the scales at around 240. That's around what he was averaging. Now, I'm not going to lie to you guys. Back in those days, me and that cat used to compete. I was a pretty big dude. And... You know, he had his swells on. He didn't have an indie tournament shoe. He was still able to run around on the main lines out there. He was handling his business. He just didn't get validated. They used to send him to old Folsom or new Folsom all the time before they flipped that joint. Anyway, he was a dark skinny Puerto Rican cat. And he was the type of dude that, you know, some motherfuckers, they just got those genetics like like me and most of you. We got to hit the gym and damn near kill ourselves just to get an inch. Right, just to grow a little bit. But I used to be out the side, you know, I'd be in the cell with this motherfucker, man, and I, I, looking out the side of my eye and be like, man, you ain't big, homie. When, you know, on the real, this motherfucker was swole. You know, I just never wanted to give him that kind of credit. I was lightweight hating, man, straight up. Why? Because he had them genetics. I used to look at this fool like, damn, man, this motherfucker, man. Seriously, though, he had his swells on. You know, he's the type of motherfucker that come out, throw on a T-shirt and wear that motherfucker the way it's supposed to be worn. You know what I'm saying? When a motherfucker just gets out the joint and you can tell that motherfucker right there is fresh out. So, you know, and matter of fact, he was also involved in that incident that I told you guys about. It was one of my past war stories where we elephant man, that one cat in La Raza Park. When we were stomping that dude out, you know, he's the type of cat that when you get when he gets on somebody, he's not going to stop. You know, I'm the one that had to stop them other two cats from uh, beating this dude to death, man. You know, I probably saved myself a case as well. Anyway. So that's a little bit about the history. You know, you had other areas out there in, in Frisco. You had other projects. You had, the like I said, the Clementina Towers. You had Hayes Valley, um, Sunny Sunnydale, Visitation Valley, um, Portrayal Terrace or Portrayal Hill, Harbor Road, Hunters Point, West Point, Hunters Point, Plaza East, Fillmore, um, Oakdale, North Beach, um, West Side Courts, Western Edition. You had uh, Alamany Street Projects, Kirkwood, and then you had the, the Robert Pitts Apartments. And like I said, I know that there's more that I'm missing, but those are some of the main ones. Those are some of the main areas out there in Frisco I used to run around in or that are considered like some of the projects. Anyway, so... Now that I got that out the way, let me tell you guys a little bit about what happened. So, matter of fact, I think me and the homie, when we caught that case for robbing this dude, and then we were trying to go get our fucking bean burritos, you know, like I said, my mom, she embraced this this homie as like her son. So, you know, she knew that we were we both got caught up. We both went to screening, and they offered us both the same thing. They offered him 10 months. They offered me 10 months. He had a 
His controlling case was violent. Mine was was violent. So we didn't get no halftime. All this fucking Rudy Poot ass shit they call parole now, where these motherfuckers are getting 30-day flash violations or 10 days. Or, you know, the, the most these dudes are doing is two months, 60 days. This shit's crazy. I never got nothing under 10 months a year when I got violated out there. I was in the car with Mateo's sister and I got fucking 10 months flat. This You guys are lucky on parole nowadays, man. I'm serious. I did probably, on my first number, I probably did a little over three years of my parole in violations. On my second number, I probably did probably more than that, probably close to three and a half years of, of parole violations. Anyway, so... You know, my mom, she knew that me and the homie were getting out the same day. She knew his situation. He didn't have a spot. You know, I didn't have nothing set up at that time. So, you know, at that time, my mom was staying at the Civic Center Hotel. She was staying at the Civic Center Hotel, which is on Market and 12th Street, downtown San Francisco. It's a, it's another, you know, lower income type of hotel. You're going to see a lot of shit that happened in there. I talked about a robbery that I, I committed in there in one of my past war stories. It's not that bad, though. It's nothing like Geneva Towers or the Pink Palace. Nothing like that. It's a small hotel. There's probably like, I don't know, 200 uh, rooms in, in that hotel. It's probably like six floors. It's real small. You know, and it's it's... There's some shit that goes on there, but it's just not that bad. You know what I'm saying? You got a lot of prostitute activity up in there. Uh, all the shit that happens in those grimy little hotels. So that's where my mom was staying at that time. She was living at that hotel. Now, she got me and the homie a room at that same hotel to just try to help us transition out. You know, she she had it hooked up. When we got out, she had a hot plate up in that motherfucker, little mini fridge. Um, it was hooked up, you know what I'm saying? So we got out the same day. We had a spot lined up for us. Cool. You know, when 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 the homie we we have his lady come over, he come over with her and he'd be like, Hey B, you got to kick rocks, boy. And yeah, all right, motherfucker. I'll be back later on tonight, and vice versa. So you know, it was cool. We were doing our thing. Moms looked out. Like I said, she embraced both of us as her sons. So on this one day, this one particular day after we were out there probably no more than two weeks, we end up going over to, to the Army Street Projects. And this is somewhere where the homie used to kick it at, too. He knew a lot of people that lived there. And, you know, he, a lot of people that used to put him on with dope and shit. They lived in the Army Street projects at that time. So, you know, we, we go to Army Street this one day, and I remember walking through there, and I, I seen this crib. Matter of fact, it's this crib that I used to fight with in juvenile hall. Me and this cat was, I don't like to talk too much about my juvenile history and all that, because who gives a fuck about what you did when you were a juvenile, right? I mean, but for the sake of this story, he's somebody that he was a crib, in Northern California, didn't have no other Crips in Juvenile Hall, so he tried to do anything and everything he could to earn brownie points with the other Africanos. The other Africanos from Fillmore, Army Street, uh, Hunter's Point that were in Juvenile with me, right? So if I ended up getting into a situation with one of them over a basketball game or over something else, and I, I was going to end up fighting with one of them, here comes this motherfucker just to earn brownie points. So I had to fight with this dude every time I got into it with anybody else. He would always just jump up and rush me. And it was something that, I mean, it, it got so bad between me and that cat that they put us both on special program because we wouldn't stop fighting either. It got to the point where this fool would try to snake me every time I came out. So it got to the point where like, every time I come out, I just rush him. Like, I'm not even giving you a chance next time you know what i'm saying you, you know i think back to that to that rocky movie when when uh clubber lang rushed the old man and they were trying to pull rocky back they were trying to hold him back and he was trying to get get away that's what i think about when i think about that fool 
snaking me. That's what he did one time. And I remember fucking the, the counselors jumped on me and I was trying to get this mom to kill this motherfucker because he stole it on me. But anyway, so I remember seeing that crib. And I, I told you guys I'd seen that same crib in San Quentin um, years later. He was in the, the chow hall and I seen him before he seen me and I crept up on him. And when I got to his table, I put my elbows on his table and I, I squatted down. I'm like, what's up, boy? And he looked over and he go, what's up, Mendoza? He was like, man, this is my motherfucking ninja right here. He was like, he was telling other cats at the table, man, me and this cat, man, we used to fucking squabble like a motherfucker, like cats and dogs when we were kids. He was like, this is a down ass metatin right here. You know, he's like, yeah, boy, man, this fool. But, you know, we both laughed about it. You know what I'm saying? But he was a tall, dark, lanky motherfucker, right? So anyway, when me and the homie are down there, Army Street, we go down there and uh, I see that crib. I see him and he was carrying two pit bull puppies. This fool was walking through the projects with no shirt on and he was carrying the puppies by the skin on the back of their necks, right? He was just walking through, looking like a fucking crazy man. And... I seen him and I'm like, hey, Raymond, what's up, boy? And he turned around and, uh, you know, we hollered for a minute. And it's funny because he'd have something to do with the incident that we would end up getting into um, not too long after I seen him. So, you know, we, we hollered for a minute and he was in the middle of something. And so me and the homie, we spun off. Now, when we there, there's an area over there where the Usos used to kick it. And I told you guys, I was real tight with a lot of these Usos. And the homeboy knew a lot of them as well. These Usos were some solid motherfuckers, man. You know, in the past, I've told you guys that I've gotten into it with some Usos. And, and, you know, it just worked out like that. It wasn't nothing personal. But this time, the motherfucking Usos will be on the team. So... You know, we th there's an area that I told you guys about that's by the pool, the, the public pool and the basketball court where these Samoans, they still kicked it there from the 80s up until the 90s. That was their spot. And, you know, we walk over there and, and we see him. Uh, like I said, Cedro was there, Hollywood, Paradise, uh, Ray Tavaki was there and some other, you know, a bunch of their little cousins. There was about 15 of them. It was a, a, a good little number of them cats. And like I said, these dudes, most of them were raised, born and raised in the Army Street Projects. Straight up. Well, we walk over there and we're, we're kicking it with them, talking to Hollywood and Paradise. And there's a Africano named Rambo that I knew from the county jail. And I've just, I know him from doing time. And you know, I was with him in, in, in Bruno, the San Francisco County Jail. He was a good dude. Good cat, uh, big ass dude, big bully type of motherfucker. You know, always the type of cat that's always throwing his weight around, you know, telling other people what to do, what not to do. Don't touch this. Don't touch that. Clean this. Don't clean that. You know, so, but me and him were cool. Me and him were cool. I he used to, you know, pull that shit on, on, on the scrubs, but you know, there was a point where he was going to get mopped up by some of the other Africanos and we had his back. But that day, it didn't matter. So what ended up happening is Rambo and Raymond, the Crip, came over there to where the Usos were. And apparently there was some debate about some of the pit bulls that were sold to Raymond. Um, the Samoans, the Usos, they sold him some pit bulls and... You know, I don't know the, the details of the whole story. I just remember hearing that, you know, there was some kind of conflict about uh, why the Usos ended up selling the pit bulls to uh, Raymond if they were if they knew that they were defective or sick or some shit like that. So, you know, they, they, they come over there and it, it's a debate, an argument. There's a lot of loud talking and eventually... You know, some other Africanos start coming over and, you know, more start coming to the basketball court, start congregating. And it just turned into, you know, a lot of people, it, it caught a lot of people's attention because, 
you know, there's there's loud talking and, and it, there's two groups, you know, the Usos on one side, Africanos on the other. And, you know, it was just cats got their shirts off and, you know, they're talking loud. So anyway, they're uh, they're going back and forth about, well, you shouldn't have sold the dogs to the homie and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And at one point, so I, what, I, what I gathered, what I remember is I think it was one of the, uh, like the Samoans that I know, Cedro, Hollywood and all those cats, I think it was one of their little cousins that actually sold the dog to Raymond, Raymond uh, uh, Taylor. And at one point, I think it was Paradise, he stepped up and he was like, he was like, well, what do you, what do you want to do, Raymond? He was like, check it out, bro. He's like, how much are you out? Whatever you're out for the dog, I'll pay you back. You know, I'll pay you for whatever money you're out. He was like, just bring the dog back. And um, apparently, from what I remember, Raymond killed the dog. He only had two of the puppies left. But the third one, because of whatever was wrong with it, he killed the dog. But yet he still expects to get his money back. So Paradise was like, nah, bro, it's not going to work like that. You're going to you either have to bring, bring me the dog or, you know, let me get the uh, one of the other dogs or something. It's like, how you how you expect to get your money back and you, you ain't got no dog? He's like, nah, bro. He's like, uh, you know, that ain't going to happen. So they're at an impasse, man, you know, and Rambo is just there backing up Raymond Taylor Ram because Rambo is just a bully like that. And me and the other homie, we're just posted up listening. You know, I already... I already knew we didn't, me and the homie didn't talk. We didn't have a chance to talk about like what we were going to do, but it was all, it, it went without saying that if the shit kicked off, we were going to back up the Usos just because, you know, I had a lot more history with them and the homie did as well. So, um, you know, at one point paradise seen that this wasn't going to get resolved and that it wasn't going nowhere and that they were they weren't doing nothing but just a bunch of yelling back and forth. And Paradise was like, you know, well, fuck it, bro. What do you want to do, man? It seems like you don't want to resolve the issue. He was like, what do you want to do, man? And Paradise took his jacket off. And that right there was a sign of aggression. You know, when he took his black his his jacket off, it's like when you do that. You guys know how it is, man. You take your jacket off or you flip your baseball cap around, you ready to fight. That's that's all the signs of, of, of a motherfucker getting ready to squabble. That's like me going out to the shoe yard with no fucking jet flaps, right? So homeboy takes his jacket off and he's like, well, you know, what you want to do, man? And Rambo just kept on going on and on. All of a sudden, Paradise just just took a quick two-piece on him. Pink, pink. Paradise and these other Samoans were some big-ass Usos. But, I mean, what Usos ain't big? Ray Tavaki was a fucking monster. He was one of those Usos that had a big-ass afro. Just a huge motherfucker, man. His hand was probably as big as my head. Um, He's one of the biggest Samoans that I've ever seen, Ray Tavaki. So... Paradise takes off on Rambo and the fight's on, man. They start going at it. And, you know, as soon as they started going at it, there was already a lot of people already that had formed on the basketball court. But now that they're squabbing, you know, more motherfuckers start coming over. Well, when they're going at it, you could already see the body language in some of the some of the Africanos that were there that it looked like they were getting ready to go in on Paradise like a couple of times. When they got close to where some of them cats were, it looked like they were they were like a just thinking about stealing on them, and it was obvious that that was going to happen. So they're going at it, and Rambo's a big dude, man. Paradise is a big dude, so you already know what's coming. So anyway, they're going at it, man. And uh, at one point. One of the other Africanos that was just was just posted up just went in on fucking paradise, and that just set it all out. You see all the rest of the Usos just jump up, and it was just a big 
it, it was a big brawl after that. It was fights everywhere, all over the basketball court. So we all start getting off. So at one point there was motherfuckers fighting all over the basketball court. And like I said, me and the homie didn't get a chance to talk to each other, but it was already we already knew without saying what we were gonna do. When the fight was on, we both just started fighting. It was almost like, you know, we didn't need an invitation. The Mafricanos actually rushed us since we were posted up with the Usos. So we're going out, we're we're getting our money too. <laughs> So we're going at it, man. And uh, I remember looking around at one point and just seeing like there was a lot of Africanos. There were way more than than there was us. I mean, at one point there was like three of them on me, and I was just trying to stop these fools from jumping on me, from jumping on my back, from getting them from coming around behind me. Anyway, I remember when at the at the best part of this brawl, man, when we're going at it. Paradise and Rambo were still fighting. And Paradise was actually had Rambo down. I don't know how it happened. I don't know if he dropped him or if Homeboy tripped, but Paradise was on top of him. And it just seemed like Paradise cracked one, another Africano cracked him, somebody else cracked him, somebody else cracked him. It just seemed like it just went back and bing, bow, bing, bing, bow. Bing, bow. This cat came flying in, hit him. This cat flew in and hit him. You know what I'm saying? It just seemed like he just went back and forth. Bing, bow, big, bow, big, bow, big, bang, bow. Until it kept on going up until, and it seemed like it was a long time, man. But, you know, when you're fighting, it seems like a hell of a long time, but it's usually only what? But with un under two minutes. So right when, when that started happening right there, I remember all of a sudden, all I heard is it's that noise that cops, you know, when cops pull up and they try to get your attention to get you to either pull over or they do it in the city all the time when they want to get a motherfucker's attention or when they want to tell you to get the fuck off the sidewalk and keep on walking, they'll come up and hit that. You guys know what I'm talking about? You should get that sound effect. If Sandman's on his job, he's going to play that sound effect. So... As soon as they did that, you hear motherfuckers say 5-0, 5-0, and everybody just broke in a thousand different directions. There ain't no way them cops could have got anybody. I mean, we all broke in different directions. Um, me and the homie ended up taking off up towards our neighborhood, 24th, and you know, most of everybody else ran up back into the projects, and the cops, I don't even know if they even got out of their car. Um, they knew they weren't going to catch nobody that day, but hey, that was it was a, a good ass squab, you know. Le unfortunately, later on, when some shit would kick off between the Army Street projects and my neighborhood, it got crazy. I'm going to tell you guys about that, um, in another story, but it got to the point where guns came out and people ended up getting shot. Um, people from my neighborhood. At one point, I was on the wrong side of the street with the ops and didn't even know it. I walked into it with somebody else. And then when I realized that my people were on the other side of the street, I walked over there and then almost ended up getting shot. It was crazy. But that's another story. Um, you know, this one was just a short one just to get you guys something. It was an incident that happened in Army Street. Those of you that are from Frisco, I'm sure you probably remember um, that incident right there. You know, an incident like that between the Usos and the, the Africanos, those types of things that they're they're talked about because, you know, it's an issue. It carries over. It, sometimes that type of shit carries over in a prison. It carries over to the county jail, carries over more to the streets. And I'm sure that, you know, there was more incidents that escalated from that in the projects, being that paradise hollywood and all those cats lived in the project so you know, so after i caught that parole violation i would end up hitting quentin and that's when i was recruited by big smiley and mike eo from salinas obviously from that point on you know a lot of the dumb shit i was doing out there like the robberies and all that shit i kind of had to back away from all that and focus more on the street regiment shit and that's what i would do but 
Hey, this is just a quick one of something that happened. Um, but Army Street will always be part of, you know, part of the history, part of the Mission District history. And so I'm always going to ha have a lot of memories, a lot of good times and bad times that, you know, I re reflect back on from Army Street. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. Episode, what is it, 36? I'm going to try to get another one out to you guys tonight. I know I need to start getting back on these things. The holidays, man, there's some other shit going on that just keeps distracting me, taking my attention away from, you know, most of the, the time that I usually spend on creating content. The raffle will be tomorrow on the 23rd. Hopefully this will get out by tonight. If not, it's going to end up getting out early in the morning. We'll see. That said, this your boy B, episode 36, War Stories, and I'm out.